Welcome to our uh, February webinar, and today we're focusing exclusively on scholarship. So it's great to see all of you here, and we appreciate you um, making time to attend today. Uh, so for the agenda today, we have some basic messaging for students and families. We're going to talk about search resources. Uh, Kathy Pham from College Bound is here, and she's going to talk, and now my dog's barking, of course, um, the College Bound Scholarship. And then we have some support strategies, and of course, as always, a mountain of resources to share with you. And um, also, we designed uh, this presentation today uh, to actually be a template for student and family events for you. Um, so we will be mailing out the PowerPoint, not just the PDF, because we have lots of notes and resources built into it. So we hope that this is something you can take and customize and make your own and use in the future. Um, the message today is there are scholarships for everything. And this was a great highlight. I don't know if any of you saw this in the news, but this is a student from Sunnyside who won a $10,000 scholarship for making a prom dress out of duct tape. And that is the dress and it's amazing. And I think, I think she's going to go a long way in design or whatever she decides to do in the future. Um, and then alongside that is the importance of really supporting our students and families uh, through this process. So as you know, we recently had um, applications open for our student advisory panel and we had quite a few applicants. We were very pleased and again, shout out to those of you who were able to recruit applicants for that. And we ended up with some great folks on that panel. But what we also learned is, gosh, they're not really so good at um, responding to writing prompts right now. And so, you know, the last time they had a full year of school before this year, which I think has mostly been a full year of school, was eighth grade. And um, I think their, their writing skills show that. Um, so we got very incomplete responses, um, not a lot of information. And what we found was their written responses were not representative at all of who they were. Uh, because when we did the interviews with them, they were rock stars. These were amazing students who had a lot to contribute. And we are so excited with um, who will have uh, participating in that advisory committee. So I think a lot of today is really about how can we support students so that they can really represent themselves well um, in the written scholarship applications and their admissions essays, which we'll get to probably later next year. So that was a big lesson learned for us that we wanted to just pass on to you. Um, somewhere in there, I missed a slide. I, I must have accidentally hidden our uh, introduction slide. So we have our full team here, plus Kathy from College Bound, as I said. Um, and so um, we're here to support you. And I kind of did a quick check. Oh, even Christina's here. Hi, Christina. I, I think everyone has themselves named as themselves. But um, just in case you don't, please make sure your name is showing up on the screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's so good to see you all, and thanks for joining us today. Here are three poll questions for you to consider. Uh, so what do you think, reality or myth? I'm going to read each question here. My team is on the varsity team, so I'm sure they're going to get a huge scholarship. Scholarships aren't worth the effort, hmm. and you can't apply for scholarships until senior year. Those are the three questions. I'm gonna launch a quick poll so that you can chime in. Give you a few minutes to, uh, to get some of your responses logged in and here they come. Nice. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. <laughs> We've got some smart people out there. <laughs> the myth, um, my teen is on the varsity 
team, so I'm sure they're getting a scholarship. Well, the reality there is athletic scholarships are not particularly um, that large. <laughs> um, only 2% of students receive them, and they fall between $300 and $14,000, which is a lot of money. But of course, that kind of depends on which school you're attending. Um, next slide, please. the myth that scholarships aren't worth the effort. Well, reality, come on, no way. The effort to apply will always pay off. First, monetarily, every dollar awarded can help reduce the overall cost, right? So that's fairly self-explanatory. Secondly, going through the detailed process of applying for a scholarship is another opportunity to gain a life skill, a valuable skill, not to mention that it shows courage and character to accomplish such a task. Next slide, please. And you can't apply for scholarships until senior year. Nope, the reality there is you can apply them um, all the way starting at age 13. So they're all over the place. And the rest of this presentation is gonna focus on those resources and support strategies to help your students gain the access to these funds. So I'm gonna hand things over to Annie. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so I think the really important kind of message in those myths is that it's all about messaging, right? So in order to combat those myths, it's really important to focus on what is true about scholarships and the scholarship process. So we've heard a lot about free money in the college access world, right? And what we really wanna talk about today is not using that terminology really at any point at all, right? Because even if students are utilizing their time to apply for scholarships or just going to school and getting a scholarship, um, that's not free, right? That time and effort is certainly time and effort. And we wanna make sure that students know that um, some scholarships or grants, et cetera, just funding the college process generally, um, it requires you to complete your coursework and maintain satisfactory ad academic progress. So just kind of some reminders around basic messaging and really stepping away from using terminology like free money and instead talking about, um, you know, you don't have to repay scholarships if you successfully complete your coursework um, or remain, you know, enrolled in school and with good grades. The other thing that we want to talk about is um, the difference between need-based and merit-based scholarships. So often we hear students say that they won't qualify for scholarships um, because, you know, it could go in either direction. Maybe some students think they don't have a big enough financial need, so they aren't eligible for scholarships. Or in the opposite direction, some students think, well, my grades, I don't have a 4.0 or I'm not on the varsity, you know, soccer team, so I'm not going to be able to qualify for these scholarships. And the reality is, is that there's scholarships out there for everybody, um, whether they are need-based and based on financial need of a student or family, or merit-based and really focused on either students' um, academic performance or their involvement in um, extracurriculars. And then uh, the majority of scholarships come from organizations and colleges. So a lot of times students don't think about the fact that their institution is somewhere that they could access a scholarship. I think that's probably because that's where we're paying our tuition bill that we don't think about those things, but there are certainly um, scholarships from the institutions that students are looking to attend. And then lastly, just a reminder and another benefit for completing that financial aid application, that so many scholarships require that you complete the FAFSA or the WASA regardless of income level. So even if students think that their family isn't gonna qualify for need, another myth busting reality that we wanna step away from, right? Um, encourage them to complete their financial aid applications because many times that's the first step um, to completing scholarship applications. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna dive into search research resources. So first and foremost, I think it's a really fun activity to start with students is to just kind of mind map what opportunities are out there and what scholarships that they can have access to based on kind of their own network of organizations, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So you can ask students to think about different organizations or clubs they're a part of. Um, in fact, you could actually ask students to think about what organizations and clubs their family members are a part of. Um, it could be uncles, aunts, parents, grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. 
Oftentimes it's just about thinking about the organizations and clubs in your network. Same goes for local credit unions or faith-based organizations, Rotary and Kiwanis Club, other animal clubs, maybe places that your students or their families are volunteering. Um, institutional scholarships, so again, thinking about where they're looking to go to school. Students or families, employers, um, again, a great time to sit down with mom or dad or grandpa and grandma and ask about, you know, where they're working and if they've heard of any scholarships. Oftentimes, you might need to call the employer too, right? So maybe even if someone's working there, they don't know a scholarship is offered, but encouraging your students to really reach out to their networks and ask about those opportunities. State and our national programs, of course, and then regional community foundations. So Marcy, did you want to say anything about Justin's um, Oops, Justin's learning. I'm not sure what's happening with my mouse today, but it wants to take control. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so um, Justin applied for a scholarship with the Seabrook Foundation. I recommend that all of your students apply. Um, it was a $1,000 scholarship, but because they didn't get enough applicants, it ended up being a $2,000 renewable scholarship. So that was never posted that that was even an option, but they didn't get enough applicants. So we hear that all the time that scholarships um, don't even have enough applicants to award all of their money. So super important. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, of course. And yeah, a great reminder of, you know, Seabrook is really just an organization within the community, right? Like there's not necessarily a super specific tie to that. Um, a parent isn't working there, but it's somewhere in the community and Justin reached out and was able to access a scholarship through that. So a great, again, mind mapping is an awesome way to just like think about the organizations within your community. All right, next slide, please. So now I wanna talk a bit about the washboard.org, which is hosted by the Washington Student Achievement Council. So it's an in-house, um, what I like to think of as a scholarship bulletin board. And so the reason I really wanna lead with the um, washboard being a scholarship bulletin board is because I know that we have all had different experiences with the washboard and utilizing it over the last few years. So in years past, we've talked about the washboard being a matching site. So it matches students to scholarships. And again, um, that's kind of messaging that we are deciding to move away from, mainly because the matching isn't perfect and we don't want students to be discouraged by that aspect. So. If there's anything you take away from today, it's that the washboard is an incredible resource if you use it as a scholarship bulletin board. So when I say that, um, the best way for students to utilize the washboard from my experience is for them to go in, create an account, and just to fill out the basics page. So there are multiple tabs that students can fill out in regards to them and their academic experience and their hopes and wishes for their college going journey. I really encourage you if you're working with students to just have them fill out that basics tab. They can then, once they've done that and created that profile, they then have access to a huge array of scholarship opportunities that are really diverse and support a wide variety of student interests and um, accomplishments and post-secondary pathways, et cetera, et cetera. The cool thing about the washboard, one of the many cool things, is that one third of the listed scholarships require a GPA of 3.0 or higher. And so what that really means is that two thirds of those scholarships don't require that GPA. So there is tons of opportunity, again, going back to that need versus merit conversation, tons of opportunities for any student to find a great scholarship on the washboard.org. And a bit to the point that Marcy was mentioning, so many of these are renewable, which means that students can continue to get funding from the same source um, as they move through their post-secondary journey. Next slide. All right, so be aware of, the reason we love the washboard.org is because number one, it's free. Number two, students' information is really safe on there. And number three, there are tons of great scholarship opportunities. So the opposite of that, right, is a site that you need to pay for scholarship listings. There are so many free scholarships out there that it is just never necessary to pay for a scholarship. Um, I would say even when, um, scholarship opportunities are reaching out via unsolicited mail or email or whatever, um, you know, be hesitant, be wary of that. Um, you don't want to give any information to a site that's asking you to pay or saying they'll do the work for you or, um, you know, a guaranteed scholarship, things like that. 
you want to be aware of terms like you're a finalist, right? Um, and that you can't get information anywhere else. So you know a lot of these research things, but number one, what I feel is most important is just reassure students they should never have to pay for a scholarship opportunity. They're applying for scholarships and using their own time um, to submit those applications and should be getting money in return, not the other way around. So do not pay for any scholarship application. Next slide. All right, scholarships that fit. So the most important thing about scholarships that fit, this is really just a quick, quick reminder about using your time wisely is that students should really be looking at the directions, making sure that they can complete the scholarship based on their own time and resource, but also making sure that they fit the minimum qualifications. Um, so if you know maybe a scholarship is specific to a postal code or a county or um, a certain academic pathway, et cetera, et cetera just making sure that the student really knows what scholarship they're applying to and that they're eligible. The other important thing around this piece is that if students know what the scholarship is for and what they're applying for, their answers are likely gonna be a lot better because they can kind of speak to what the scholarship is offering and who they are in relation to that offering. All right, next slide. Well, I think I can get started on it anyways. Uh, oh, here we go. So this slide is just a really awesome resource. Again, we're gonna send out this PowerPoint. So awesome that these things are linked here. We have so many resources on the Gear Up webpage in regards to scholarships, of course. So plenty of um, actual scholarship postings, resources around how students can get their essays reviewed or things to consider within a scholarship, um, tips and tricks, a lot of the information we're covering here, um, but if a student is interested in kind of doing a deep dive or if you're looking for resources to kind of get conversations started around scholarships, definitely recommend going to the Gear Up page and looking under our scholarship tab on the student or educator um, pages. All right. I don't know what's happening today. I am so sorry. I'll use the mouse and it doesn't work. And then I use, don't want to use the mouse and it's moving forward. So there's something a little glitchy going on for me today. I'm so sorry. It's awful. Um, but I'm going to turn it over now to Kathy from our College Bound Scholarship Service. Thank you, Marcy. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Kathy Pham. I'm a program associate for College Bound Outreach at the Washington Student Achievement Council. And I'm so excited to be here to share information about Washington's College Bound Scholarship. Next slide, please. So what is the College Bound Scholarship? The College Bound Scholarship is an early commitment of state financial aid to eligible students who enroll in middle school and meet the pledge requirements, which I will cover shortly. The College Bound uh, Scholarship covers average tuition at public college rates, some fees, and a small book allowance at over 65 colleges, universities, and technical schools in Washington State. All of this information can be found on our College Bound webpage, which contains amazing resources, such as free digital materials for students, families, counselors, and anyone else who's interested in this scholarship. Now, as you continue to work with your students in your position, this question may come up quite often. What do juniors and seniors need to know about accessing the College Bound Scholarship? Well, first, students must meet the College Bound Scholarship pledge requirements, and also meet state residency requirements. The pledge requirements are, one, to graduate from a Washington State high school or approved homeschool program with a cumulative GPA of 2.0 or higher, two, have no felony convictions, and three, to apply for financial aid by completing the FAFSA or WASFA, beginning their senior year of high school, and then every year they are in college. Now, students may file as early as October 1st. Um, and the second thing for this is that students 
um, in order for them to use their scholarship, they must be admitted to and enroll in an eligible institution in Washington within one year of their high school graduation. And after this, their eligible post-secondary school will then determine if their income meets the eligibility guidelines. For students to access the scholarship, a family's income must be at or below the amount in the chart listed on our College Bound webpage for their household size. After that, the school then calculates their financial aid award, sends students an award letter indicating how much financial aid they will receive, and then disperses their financial aid, including their College Bound scholarship before the classes begin. So I just walked you through kind of the steps for a student so they can see all of these um, stages. After that, what do we do at WASAC? We then match financial aid applications to college bound applications within our WASAC secure portal called the toolbox. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, I also have good news to share. If you haven't heard it already, starting this year, 2021, 2022, the college bound scholarship has been made easier. What does that mean? Now, all public school students are eligible for the college bound, uh, for the college bound scholarship will be automatically enrolled. That means students no longer need to complete a college bound scholarship form. However, they are still required to complete the financial aid form, either again, the FAFSA or WASFA. Now, in addition, as you support school counselors, we would love, love, love your help as gear up coordinators to help us update student contact information in the toolbox, WASAC's secure portal. The updated, um, by updating student contact information, that will help us deliver important information to college bound students. And we cannot do this without the help of our districts and schools. So we thank you so much for your support with our students, with um, families as well. And if you do not have access to the portal and you need access, feel free to email us at collegebound at wasac.wa.gov with your request. And we'll make sure you can get the access to help us update the information of your students. Next slide, please. All right, so next I would like to highlight additional resources to best support you and your students. These are links um, that are embedded in this slide for your reference and it contains the following information. The first thing is the handout um, that provides an overview of what I just talked about so that you don't have to recreate the wheel yourself. It is available in English and Spanish. Again, these slides will be sent to you so you have access to this. Number two is, if you haven't already, I highly encourage you to join our newsletter. Um, you, uh, your students, the, their family members can sign up to receive our free email newsletter to get information on college bound scholarship and college and career planning. And as early, the earlier they sign up, the better. So they have this information on hand. The third resource I'd like to talk about would be the financial aid calculator. Uh, this tool really helps students and families estimate what college, what Washington College Grant and Pell Grant financial aid might look like for a student. And last but not least, we have an amazing Otterbot texting service. It is a free texting service that can help college bound seniors with the financial aid process. And it's wonderful because students and their families can text this robot, uh, this bot 24 seven. And it has information such as links and resources to help guide the students or to help answer any quick questions. So again, um, you will have this information for you. Um, and so you can access these slides. And if you have any questions at all, because I know I went through a lot, remember, uh, we are here to support and help you. So if you or your students have any questions after this webinar, please feel free to reach out to myself, or you could email our um, main inbox, which is collegebound at wasac.wa.gov. So thank you so much for your time. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. I'll hand it over to Beth now. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I uh, wanted to share another uh, state uh, 
grant opportunity or scholarship opportunity, and it's the Washington State Opportunity Scholarship. Um, it was created in 2011 by the state legislature, and it's a public-private partnership um, to, designed to increase um, um, students um, and graduates in the STEM and healthcare fields in Washington State. Um, and since 2011, they've actually added, originally it was just a BA scholarship, and now they've added a career in tech ed scholarship, as well as a graduate scholarship. Um, the scholarship can cover tuition, but it can also cover other things like housing, transportation, and other um, cost of attendance uh, aspects. Uh, the, you, you'll see that the uh, BA scholarship, uh, the deadline is coming up and it is in March. The career in tech ed is the unique thing about that. And um, it's in the notes section of the PowerPoint, which we'll send out that though it looks like the deadline has passed, that is actually offered three times a year. Um, and so the next time it will be offered will be in the spring or summer. And when I, <clears throat> when I most recently went on the website, the date was TBD. So I don't have that up there, but it's worth um, checking that website again or following them on social media so you get updates. Um, and that is true for the grad school uh, scholarship as well. Um, the, this scholarship also um, has been traditionally or historically, it's been um, about 50% of the recipients are women and about three quarters are uh, BIPOC students and first gen students, about, uh, again, about three quarters of the recipients. And in fact, we actually have a, a local connection to a scholarship recipient. And I was going to ask if if she doesn't mind, Kelly's son, um, Kelly has her own um, experience with this scholarship. If she wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about uh, her own experience. Sure, Beth, yeah. Um, my son actually got the baccalaureate scholarship, was awarded that. Um, he's at the UW and he'll be graduating actually this year. So he's in his fifth year. Um, and. He actually received it for the first two years because when he changed his major and he went from a STEM major to, um, to a construction and real estate major, um, he lost the scholarship. But for the first two years that he got it, it was wonderful. It is renewable for four years and actually grows in the amount. Um, so it's larger by the fourth year. Um, and they're really, what I found about them is they're great about sending out all the reminders. They're really good about contacting the students and following up and making sure that they're, uh, you know, resubmitting what they need to for that scholarship. So, um, you know, and I just would like to say, just give a plug for scholarships. I, you know, I can't say enough how I think the first year it's always the hardest, but once you get into college and there's so many more avenues that come open at that time, Caleb is graduating college without any student loans being taken out. And that's most of that is all due to scholarships, really. So, you know, and once he just started applying, once he got in through different fraternities from different clubs from different he just and you know like I said debt free so I am just elated and scholarships work yeah thanks Kelly for sharing that story hey Kathy if you're still here we had a question in the chat about college bound and undocumented students are you here to answer that yeah I was, I'm sorry, I was going to jump in and answer it, but I had to turn off my video because my internet's unstable and I, I had to give it a little bit of a break. Um, so I apologize, but I can still see your beautiful faces. Uh, so students who are undocumented, they can still, they're eligible for the college bound scholarship. Um, they have to meet the requirements of it uh, by registering, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat too. Um, and then the other thing is that the residency, remember residency has changed from um, over the summer from three years to one year. And I'm gonna put a link in the chat that has uh, the Padlet that has all of our flyers about the residency change. So instead of having to have residency established three years prior to having a college establish your residency, it's one year prior to starting college and having a college establish your residency uh, that a student has to live in Washington. And so let me put that in the chat. So Thanks, on that Christina. Padlet, it's, 
just under the new residency law information flyers and they're already translated in multiple languages and all the languages are there. I encourage you definitely to share those with students because there's a lot that don't realize that opportunity is there for them. I'm really excited about it. All right, thanks so much. And thanks for the question, Rosalie. Um, oh, and Adrienne put in a, a tip as well for folks in the chat. All right, now I'm going to turn it over to Dan and I'm gonna work really hard on getting these slides right. <laughs> Wish me luck. Okay, Marcy, it's all on you. <laughs> no worries. So the next few slides will contain not only tips, but best practices um, that have been proven to help students submit successful applications and receive scholarship awards. My son um, is a senior now in his high school and our family's going through all of this. So I feel like um, I'm pretty close to the process of what's happening. Um, so I'm gonna start with general tips and then I'm gonna do a deep dive um, for each part of an application process. I'm gonna talk about filling out forms, following directions, writing essays, securing letters of recommendation, requesting transcripts, just to name a few. Um, so I know there's a lot of info and just a reminder that all of this um, will be shared out with you, the PowerPoint along with presenter notes. Okay, so here we go. Applying for scholarships is very similar to applying for admissions to a college. So much of the same info is required throughout the process. It just happens to be going to a different organization like a Rotary or a community organization or even a national foundation, um, as we mentioned earlier. <clears throat> that frog came over into my throat too. So specific tips for students include starting early. It's always a great idea, right? Um, Get your information squared away. That is, get it in order. And there are plenty of details to keep you busy when it comes to applying for scholarships, like the deadlines, because they run the gamut. They're all over the place, anywhere from September 1st all the way through um, the following midsummer. And because there's such a wide window, we'd recommend not waiting until the night before, like my son did <laughs> for some of his, but that's okay. We're all just humans. Um, a good practice is to always make sure that students are eligible before putting time into any particular scholarship. So um, how many times have we all been told, you know, to read the directions before you get started instead of just hopping right in? Have a plan about staying organized. And during that scholarship process, you need something to help keep you on track. So follow every single direction on an application or a website to a T and double check every answer for accuracy and spelling. Another good practice for staying organized also means keeping copies of everything that you submit. So taking screenshots or printing out what you've submitted can help you save time in the future because you're going to need to do that, right? Applying for a scholarship is not a one-time affair. Students will be doing this um, each year because things you know, can potentially change. Next slide, please. Good job, Marcy. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the application um, itself. First, read the instructions. I can't stress enough how important it is to read the directions. Again, making a note of the requirements and the due dates and thinking about how much time each piece is gonna take. The second thing, read the instructions again. We've heard this so much, but it is so valid. So let's move on. Number three is allow enough time for each piece. If you need to request a transcript or a letter of recommendation or to put together a portfolio or do a special project for this scholarship application, this can take several weeks. So um, managing time is huge. The next one, copy and paste with care. So you, you wanna feel free to make use of the material that you've already created from application to application. But you do wanna make sure that you personalize each piece um, so that you're addressing specifically what that scholarship is looking for. This next box here is kind of interesting to me um, because I've spent a lot of time, not only in education, but in the business world. So go with me here. Picture the ideal candidate. One way to do this is to read the application material ahead of time, 
find about find out about that organization or the person who's offering the scholarship, right? Do your research, do your background, um, your dig. And if you know their goals and the purpose of that scholarship, you can start to paint a picture of what this ideal candidate might look like, what they may say, what they do, what they believe and what they're hoping for. And then you can highlight the characteristics that you share with that ideal candidate. So this is very similar to how the business world markets to consumers. They too picture the ideal consumer and adjust their messaging to what matters to those buyers, me and you. So it's good advice, good counsel. The next box here, answer the questions directly with specific personal examples. Going along with, here we go, copying and pasting really, really matters. And a lot of times students want to just reuse that same personal essay over and over because they spent so much time perfecting it, you know, getting it to really look good. However, if you find that you can kind of use the same essay over and over without modifying it, it's probably too general. So you, you do need to tweak it and make sure that you're answering those questions directly with specific personal examples that are tailored to that particular scholarship. After all, what would the ideal candidate answer. Then we get down to being careful with your personal information, right? Um, operational security. You want to be very careful. Some applications are asking folks to submit their social security number or private information. Usually this is so that that funding source uh, can verify identity and eligibility. Um, because they're going to be sending monies to certain credit accounts. And you can get around this um, as a student or a parent without being a bother by simply answering the last four digits of your social security number or by contacting that scholarship provider and seeing if you can just use your student ID, um, the college student ID. You're also welcome to politely contact the donor and ask if there's an alternative um, set of information that you can provide because you're cautious of sending info, whether that be digitally over the web or even in snail mail these days. So if it makes you uncomfortable, you can't go wrong by asking for that clarification. Okay, finally, um, these special circumstances. Explain, don't complain. Sometimes on applications, you're asked to write about challenges you've had to overcome or things you've had to deal with, why your grades have dropped or why your community service might not be as beefy as they would like it to be. In these situations, make sure that you speak to your challenges respectfully and that you present yourself as someone who is humbly learning from those challenges rather than being a victim to those. If you experience a challenge that have caused your grades to drop, that was true for me, <laughs> true for my son, let them know specifically what actions you've taken to turn that around. And if you um, didn't have the community service hours that you would like, let them know the other things that were maybe notable that were occupying your time. Remember, you want to be that ideal candidate, and the ideal candidate never complains. And then, last reminder, did you follow the instructions? And make sure you've got someone there to proof those applications. Each piece really matters. Okay, next slide, please. In addition to the application itself, you may be asked to provide like these other pieces. Um, and there are things that we wanna highlight for each one of these. So the first block there on the left, letters of recommendation. Always let your recommenders know there's a request coming. And even if you've talked to them before about writing a letter of recommendation, just give them a heads up. Let them know specifically when to expect this letter of recommendation needs to be turned in. Now, here's another tweak to this. Send them a cover letter that outlines the scholarship and their responsibilities of a, as a recommender, the due dates, and any information they need uh, to know about writing that letter from a targeted viewpoint. You should always mention in your cover letter why you are choosing them as a recommender. You want to be personal, right? Um, you want to provide them with a copy of your resume or your activities list and highlight the pieces relevant to that scholarship. And you may also choose to remind them of a time when you did something really cool um, so that they can super personalize that letter for you. Check in with them about a week before it's due and always send them a thank you note, please. 
It's also a nice courtesy to follow up with them to let them know the result of that scholarship. And even if you didn't win, you can thank them for their support and keep that door open in case you might need their support in the future. That second piece there talks about the profile, right? Um, and this is a part of many application processes. And you want this to be as complete as possible. Remember to think of the ideal candidate and highlight the pieces that reflect the characteristics you share with that ideal candidate in your profile. But here's the other piece, you need to be real. Don't exaggerate your involvement, but also you don't want to downplay um, yourself in any significant way. So, you know, if you were the water boy on the varsity football team, you don't want to say that you played varsity football. That would be an exaggeration, I think. Um, likewise, though, if you had to play a parental role, caring and providing for um, a younger sibling, it would be a misrepresentation to say that you simply babysat for a little brother. So please be specific and be honest when you're building that profile. As far as essays are concerned, just like with your college applications, make sure you follow the instructions with that essay. Answer the question directly and fully revise your work. Scholarship junkies and Get Schooled will review these essays for free. And even various writing centers offer this assistance. When it comes to transcripts, you got to really allow time. Things have really shifted in the past few years. And we used to say, you know, give it about two weeks, but a lot of schools are struggling. You might need to um, extend the amount of time that it takes to get transcripts sent. Next slide, please. There are three main reasons for following up with a recommender or scholarship provider. First, Thank you, give thanks, right? You should always send a thank you note. What a great lifelong habit. And the handwritten note is always the best. But of course, if you don't have a physical address, then it's perfectly okay to reach out and send a personal, sincere email. And whatever you do, just don't send a generic thank you. Um, so many times people make mistakes. They're sending a, a thank you to me and it's like, dear Bob, well, I'm Dan, I'm not Bob. <laughs> and I kind of know right out of the gate that they probably sent a generic thank you. And approach that thank you letter like you would a personal contact, right? Be personal, be specific. Thank them for the opportunity. Reinforce um, how you're gonna put those funds to use and thank them for supporting education. Gosh, that can't be um, overstated. The second piece are the next steps. If you've been awarded a scholarship, you should follow up with a thank you and clarification for the next steps. Make sure that you are crystal clear on what needs to be submitted and by when, back to deadlines and timelines. You may also choose to follow up after any deadline to ensure that your materials were received and to check on the status of that word. In fact, I texted my son this morning and he's gonna be doing that with his, uh, his number one university choice. The third piece, keep in touch. Right? Keep the lines of communication open. It's always a good idea to send up a follow-up note after you've started your school year to let those donors know how you're using the money. It's going to make them feel good about choosing you and will plant that seed in their head for supporting you in the future. We'll also build that bridge for future support, right? whether that's in the form of a scholarship or maybe what about an internship or a job or mentorship. Okay, next slide, please. And the last one, <laughs> when you're trying to cash in on a scholarship that you've won, you're gonna have to answer a few basic questions for yourself. And remember that the scholarship you will have received, there are these requirements that are, that are key to getting that money where it needs to end up and processing it. So in both cases, you may need to follow up with both parties to make sure you can answer these three essential questions. Who needs what? From a scholarship standpoint, they may need you to provide contact info, proof of enrollment and verification of anything you entered on your application. From a school standpoint, they may need you to be registered at least half time to process those funds through your account. Make sure to check with the scholarship provider and the school to know what conditions are for your scholarship so that you can meet those requirements and address potential conflicts between the school and the scholarship rules. Okay, so then where does the money go? In most cases, that provider, scholarship provider, they're gonna send that money 
directly to your school so it can be applied to your account. You may not get that $50,000 check that you can pack into your wallet. I actually had somebody ask me that one time. So for some schools, it goes through the financial aid office, and then other schools, it could end up going through something called like student financial services. So you'll want to contact your school and know exactly where uh, external scholarship money needs to be sent. Don't just assume. Um, it's important to let your school know as soon as possible to expect that scholarship that you won so that they can also factor into your financial aid award letter. And the sooner you do that, the sooner you have a final and accurate award letter. That's a good thing. The scholarships you win are likely going to change that financial aid that you are offered. So there are plenty of numbers to track. And then finally, um, how can the funds be used? <laughs> So some scholarships specify how they're used, right? Some will say that they can only be used for certain things and they're gonna have very specific instructions um, on what to do if there are excess funds. Some scholarships don't specify it. Some schools have rules that tuition and fees must be covered first and anything in excess can be held in the student's account or distributed to the student. Some scholarships can only be applied during certain terms or only if your GPA um, remains at a certain level. So you're gonna want to find out your terms. You may also wanna follow up periodically with that scholarship provider and the school. Once again, if you don't see that amount posted in your account or in your portal, um, it may be that they're missing info or just taking longer than you planned for. That's gonna give you an opportunity to make a plan, when to expect it and to provide them with any additional info that may be missing. Okay, and then, one important note is that any scholarships you receive in excess of tuition, fees, and mandatory books and supplies are considered taxable, and that's a good problem to have. All right, well, thanks for being patient, and I'm gonna pass things back over to Beth. Thanks, Dan. Um, next up, I have some tips for you staff members uh, on how to help students stay organized. Um, as Dan mentioned, there are are a variety of components to scholarships, and it can get chaotic, especially when you're factoring in college uh, or your post high school admissions and you're factoring your financial aid application in. So one thing that we have on our website, and the link is below, and um, there's also some notes um, embedded in the, in the PowerPoint, is we have a senior year binder system. It was developed by the McNair program in higher ed. Um, and it includes um, 10 different sections. So we, it walks, the binder system on our website um, is, uh, it walks an advisor, a college access professional through the steps of how to help a student develop the binder. So the binder has 10 tabs and it explains the, what is needed for each tab, um, the rationale, and it provides an example. So for example, you might have a list of your scholarship listings. You might have personal essays, personal statements, um, a brag sheet, letters of recommendation, different tracking sheets, um, your college list, and it just helps students stay organized. So this, this binder system could be a hard copy, it could be electronic, but um, the, the manual that's on our website can walk you through the process of how to help students stay organized um, their senior year. And then the next resource that we have on the next slide is Scholar Snap. That is a resource that's listed on our scholarship webpage on the Gear Up website. The Scholar Snap is actually hosted by the college board. So it's legitimate um, and it uh, helps students create a profile and save time on um, their application. So if they're applying for uh, scholarships through the college board's scholarship listings, they can use this scholar snap to like draw down information. Um, so, it can help save some time, like Dan was saying, you know, about the copy and pasting. This is a, um, an actual recommended way to do the copy and pasting. And again, it's, it's through the college board. So that is something to check out. It's new, it's been around for about a year or two. Um, so 
that is another resource um, that is mentioned on our scholarship webpage. And then some school strategies that we have um, listed. Um, we encourage folks, as you know, to always have financial aid, um, filing events at your school. I, Christina is here. Um, she often hosts virtual events. Um, and we encourage you to uh, participate in a virtual event or host an in and or host an in-person event. If you are um, participating in one of ours or you're hosting your own, consider um, including scholarships uh, as a topic um, in, in the event itself. And we do have a suggested activity that can be fun. Um, that's on the next slide. It's called zombie apocalypse. Um, and some of you might have played this before with, um, with us in a workshop. This uh, zombie apocalypse activity is based on a real scholarship through Unigo. It's an annual scholarship due on Halloween every year. And it just requires anybody above the age of 13 to write a 250 word essay on how they would survive this zombie apocalypse and it's a funny little scholarship but the reason we have this as an activity is we have students read the scholarship activity or, or the scholarship um, description and read what it's asking students to do and it's asking it provides the eligibility and it's asking them to write this essay that meets these criteria and so what we did for this particular activity, we at Gear Up created uh, fictional essays and profiles of students. And the activity itself is um, imagining yourself as a scholarship uh, committee and you're scoring scholarships to see who meets the ed eligibility criteria and whose essay is best. And so you walk through and score and you can see some might have the best essay, but they don't meet the criteria of eligibility. Some might have need, you know, but you know, theirs is tossed out for this reason. It's sort of like if you've ever read or scored grant applications, it makes you a better grant writer. And so this walks students through the process of understanding when you're looking at a scholarship, how to break it down and make sure that you are hitting all the points um, so that you know like how to play the game, how to win the scholarship. Um, and it is a real, since it is a real annual scholarship, if you do this activity with students, then you could actually have them write an essay for um, this scholarship, which will again be due around on Halloween of 2022. So that's one fun activity um, that you can do in an advisory or um, a workshop with students and families. Um, and now we have a couple of updates as we get close to the end of today's webinar. We have some save the dates. We have a March virtual event scheduled. It's a little bit longer than the coffee break. It's nine to noon. Um, I believe I've sent out the invite if, and I will be sure to send it out again. Um, it's for Gear Up paid staff and other folks are at, always encouraged and welcome to attend. And then we also are currently planning on having our year six planning workshop in person. We hope to have it in Wenatchee. Um, it's in May 3rd and 4th for cohort and May 5th and 6th for priority schools. It's for gear up paid staff and um, one building administrator at least um, are required to attend. Marcy and Kelly, do you have anything you want to say on the logistics or content or anything? About yeah, so um, last month, you know, we said we had really hoped that we'd be able to be in person in May in Wenatchee. And uh, Kelly and I are in the process of signing the contract. Um, so unless something changes, you know, for the worse, um, we will be in person in May um, for the year six planning. We have reserved a very large ballroom space at the Hilton Garden Inn. So um, we'll have um, one table per school available so we can have some reasonable social distancing um, in the space. It's much larger than space that we normally get um, for these events. 
Um, and we'll have rooms available at the Hilton Garden Inn. It's a new hotel right on the river. Um, so we will, um, you know, use precautions so that everyone's safe. I will say that, um, you know, if you are not comfortable attending um, for any reason, there will not be any consequence um, for that. Uh, because, you know, I really do respect that for our team and for all of you. So if you're not comfortable being in person, we'll make other arrangements for you to get the same information. But we do hope to see most people um, there and be able to spend a couple of days doing year six planning and especially for cohort schools getting ready for senior year. Um, I think that's everything I want to say about that now. Um, please, when you're, um, we'll send out the registration information actually fairly soon so we can get good counts on that. So um, please be certain when you register that that those folks will be able to attend so that we don't end up with a lot of extra uh, food and rooms <laughs> set aside uh, for that event. So hey, anyone Marcy. Has me? Yeah, go ahead. Erin uh, has a question um, about how many people are they allowed to attend? She okay. didn't know whether you had said that already. Yeah, so um, we're, we're thinking like maybe three to four per school um, would be a good number. We will have one table with six chairs for every school. So you could bring that many, but we'll start really getting a capacity if, we, if everyone brings six. So I think two to three to four is probably reasonable and we'll monitor that so that if we feel like we're getting to capacity and you have asked for six people to come, we might ask you to drop one. Um, but gear up paid staff and a building administrator, maybe a counselor, if that's someone you work closely with would be recommended. So just stay in good communication with us about that. And we'll definitely try to accommodate everyone that wants to attend. Um, but we also want to just be able to have some good space available. Thanks for asking that, Erin, I appreciate it. All right. And we have one last uh, poll. Um, if um, somebody could launch it, it's launched. Yeah, we're launched. Would somebody who could see the poll read it for me? <laughs> yeah, so the first question is, should Wasac host virtual student family workshops? So some of you have gotten together and, and done this on your own and hosted uh, virtual events for multiple schools, and it's gone really well. So we wanted to know, and it looks like I already can see the answer is yes, you'd like us it to is. do that on your behalf. Uh, we're at 100%. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then we are asking for the topic. So oh, uh, financial aid overview, scholarships, transitions, admissions, it looks like they are all very popular. And then if you have um, other topics, if you can put those in the chat box and can someone please write those down? Um, so Sherry's suggesting a family event to navigate the Gear Up website. That's a great idea. Um, Russell says, um, asking families what might be of interest to them during the virtual. Yeah, so get some family feedback about what they'd like to do. Great idea. Can I ask uh, also, um, oh, thank you, Rosalie. Can I ask also, are, would people have a preference in nights or weekends? Like would a weekday evening or a weekend be better? Any kind of preference on that? Not weekend, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Well, I don't want to work on the weekend either. Like, I'm not really like, I'm not jumping at that either. Um, Monday through Thursday, I see. Um, <laughs> if we recorded it, would that be a value? Monday through Thursday. Virtual pizza delivered in real life. Yeah, we could definitely look at trying to do, um, you know, gift cards just like you all do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Recording would be great. 
Marcy, can I clarify that question, that suggestion? Are you saying recording it and then we would then show it? Or do you mean have a live event that's then recorded that we can share with families who couldn't attend? Yes. <laughs> I think both of those things could be true. So we would have a live event, I think is what we'd really like to try to do, uh, given the interest. Um, but we would also record it so then you could post it on your websites or send it out to families. I, I think that would be, I mean, that's what we do now with these webinars. So that's definitely manageable. I wonder if we also were able to create a script to that. Maybe we could have the script translated into a foreign language if, if, if that was needed. Um, maybe with closed caption, we'll have to look into that. All right, that is wonderful feedback. All right, I think I have most of it captured. So if everybody's taking notes from our team, we'll probably have everything. Okay, we can end that poll, is that right? All right, I'm gonna close that. It won't let me. <laughs> And with that, uh, thanks to my team. This was definitely a group effort today. So thanks to everyone for contributing. Thank you all for being here. I hope you are staying well and staying safe. And uh, as always, thanks for all the work you're doing on behalf of our students and families. It's great to see you today. Thanks.